Hello. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, I'm Tamo, um, also known as Kebi of Farbrausch, and uh, my topic of today will be getting rid of audio aliasing. Um, it's quite funny because, as uh, I told someone about the seminar, um, he asked me something like, is there aliasing in audio at all? Never knew that. And uh, yeah, quite, there is, you know, uh, in graphics, you know, you're pretty used to anti-aliasing, like turn it on and the whole graphics are getting slower, but you get maybe 10 frags more per second or something like that. Um, and the same thing applies to audio. If things get too detailed, without anti-aliasing, it will start to suck. So, what is aliasing? Audio data um, consists of quantized samples taken at continuous intervals, you know, s sound is a continuous wave, it's an analog thing, and you're taking samples, that's why samples are called samples, you really measure those continu this continuous wave at certain intervals and store that. And the problem is, as well, the intervals are in time steps instead of continuous, and uh, of course the values you are sampling are in steps too, and this does not reflect reality, because reality is analog and we're digital, and this, yeah, it sucks. So, aliasing is um, the artifacts occurring from the uh, inaccuracy of sampling because we have this analog wave and we take one inaccurate sample of it and this is called an alias like it's almost that thing but not really and uh, so aliasing is known as um, the error that you can hear um, because of this and aliasing as I've said can occur in time because we're sampling in discrete time steps and it can uh, occur in amplitude because we have like only 16 bits of resolution for our sample so, let's start with the amplitude ali aliasing. Oh, uh, I've got a typo there. <laughs> um, lack of sampling precision results in noise and less punch. Uh, if you have heard um, old modules from the Amiga, or even worse, samples played on a C64, um, you know that they are all pretty noisy. This is because we only have eight or four or whatever bits um, of resolution to sample with, and of course, this is inaccurate. And this, yeah, doesn't sound good, and it has the additional problem that it sounds like lush, and it doesn't really get neither good bass nor good travel out. So, if we're synthesizing, we should throw many bits at the audio data. Um, and if we're processing the samples, this makes it even worse, because, like, we have a sample with, let's say, 16 bits, and we want to um, increase the volume by 20%, and you can pretty much say that 16 bit plus 20% more, uh, again, downsampled to 16 bit, um, makes it even more inaccurate. So, only using 16 bits in a synthesi synthesizer is a really bad idea because um, as soon as you're processing it, as soon as you're filtering it, as soon as you're changing the volume, the sound quality will degrade and degrade and degrade until it's really, really noisy. So, if you're coding a synthesizer, use 32-bit floating point values or 24.8 fixed point values and clip to 16-bit afterwards. So, you've got plenty of headroom, you've got many, many, many more bits than you will ever need in your life. Uh, oh, maybe not that, but you will ever need for um, synthesizing sound, and then you take the 16-bit range that you want to have uh, at the end and clip it into there. And if that's, it's not enough for you, if you uh, are one of the few persons who can hear the noise occurring from 16-bit sampling, um, then you can still dither. Dither is uh, the same thing as in graphics. You just let, for example, the last bit flip up and down to make up for the inaccuracies and introduce some noise um, to get between the values of the bits. So um, if you want to know more about that, I won't elaborate on that further, but uh, you can, of course, ask me. Okay, up to the interesting stuff. Temporal aliasing. This is the aliasing that occurs because we are sampling in continuous intervals. First thing is, what, is, what if our sampling points are inaccurate? This is um, totally out of scope here because we are synthesizing s things and we simply assume that, it's okay, uh, that the sampling points are in discrete time steps, in continuous time steps. Um, if they are not, then it's most probably a broken sound card, uh, which we can't do anything against, so this doesn't really matter. The nasty stuff begins, though, at the sampling theorem. The sampling theorem is, um, yeah, due to two people who, uh, you know, like, found it out and invented it. The first one is Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. This guy looks quite handsome, I think. Um, 
found out that all periodic signals can be expressed as the sum um, of single frequencies. Though, so this means every sound, every signal, or every, every wave, every wave in the water, every image, every whatever, um, consists of single discrete frequencies, uh, not discrete, but of frequencies, which are mixed together. And the Fourier transform decomposes this um, signal into the frequencies. There's the normal, dis, uh, the normal Fourier transform, which does this completely mathematically with uh, analog signals and all that stuff, but uh, this is not really what we need. Uh, we need the discrete Fourier transform. That takes a chunk of sample dat data and decomposes it into a set of frequencies. So, and the problem about these frequencies is the sampling theorem. If we sample at a certain rate, at a certain sample rate, uh, now abbreviated SR um, in my slides, the highest frequency that can be sampled is half of the sample rate. Because um, when you imagine that a single wave is a sine wave, and the sine wave is as fast as um, our sampling rate, we will essentially sample always the same point of the sine wave, and we get a flat line at the end. So to have a wave, a wave that goes up and down, we can um, at max sample half of the sampling frequency. This is called the Nyquist frequency coming from Harry Nyquist, born 1889, died 1976. Uh, ironically, the year that I was born, but uh, I don't have anything to do with it. Um, the problem about the sampling theorem is, if we have higher frequencies that we sample, they get somehow mirrored back into the range of frequencies that can be sampled. Um, I've prepared an example for this. So, we have a wave here that we sample at certain points. If we sample it and we look at the sample, which is in the second row, it looks like this. And um, it sounds about like this. I hope that it sounds like somewhat. Do we get a signal anyway? Hello, audio guy. Hello? There should be a coming sound out of my laptop. At least I hope so. Five minutes ago it worked. Ah, okay. Yeah, put a bit more, a bit louder. It's, it's right. So, if we increase the frequency, the wave will get more and more inaccurate, as you see. Ironically, what is uh, at the moment getting played is really that strange thing at the bottom, but uh, it still is a sine wave because the sampling theorem says, uh, says up to half of the sampling frequency, and we are at 0 0.5 uh, times the sampling frequency, it works. So I can go up and go up and go up and still go up and still go up until here, where you see that the sample is really only up, down, up, down, up, down, because we are sampling the outermost points. The thing is, if I increase now the rate further, it goes down again. You see, the sine wave is getting higher and higher, but the sampling points somehow magically um, produce a lower wave. Until, at exactly this sampling rate, we have complete silence. And if we go even higher, the whole thing starts again. So, basically, this is aliasing. I hope you understood that so far. So, so what? I mean, we're not sampling, we're generating samples. Uh, how does aliasing affect us? Um, we're safe, huh? are we? No, we are not. So if you look at the image below, which is awfully resampled because of Adobe Reader, sorry. Um, it's the FFT analysis, the fast Fourier transform analysis of a sawtooth wave. And you see, it's starting with a big peak, and then um, going up in the spectrum, the peaks fall off and fall off, fall off, but they eventually never reach zero. So if we have a normal sawtooth wave, um, the, to uh, the frequencies that the sawtooth wave is considered of go up into, in, in, into infinity. 
And synthesizing is, in effect, taking samples from some mathematical formula, because um, when we uh, synthesize a sawtooth, the formula is easy. It's like one linear thing that goes up and then jumps down again. So it's like a linear um, equation f um, defined in intervals. And we sample, actually, from this wave, from this mathematical formula. Form, uh, formula. So if we synthesize a sawtooth wave, um, the naive way, we get something that doesn't sound really good. Um, can you uh, do it a, bit loud, a little louder, please? So this. is an alias sawtooth wave that is uh, synthesized the naive way. Again, hear the dirt that comes when it goes up. So this sounds like shit, to be precise. Um, what we want is this. I've uh, prepared also an anti-alias sawtooth wave, which can go all the way up without introducing any frequencies that don't belong. So, and processing is also evil sometimes, because if processing doesn't only change frequencies, but introduces new ones, who knows where these frequencies really are? If they are above the Nyquist point, we are pretty screwed. So, what can we do? In principle, it's easy. Make sure you don't generate too high frequencies or get rid of them before it's too late. Um, this means either we have synthesizing formulas which don't even produce those frequencies, which are too high, or if we have formulas which do, and we can't, uh, we can't do anything about it, we have to somehow filter them away. So the easy solution is oversampling. Oversampling is about that what um, graphics cards do. They render the image in a far higher resolution and then filter it down and it looks anti-aliased. Mm. And the same we do in sound. We render the whole thing in a Higher, fra higher sample rate, and then filter it down, and we get almost anti-LEAs results because, of course, we, uh, it doesn't really work. So it's easy to implement, but CPU intensive, like, of course, if you double the sampling rate, you have to synthesize double the amount of data, and it won't kill all aliasing. So it's like, yeah, more workaround than a solution. Um, solution two is band-limited synthesis. It's completely aliasing free, um, but, Depending on the situation, it's uh, either hard to implement because there's some pretty heavy math um, involved, which I won't go into detail here because it would be a two hours lecture just, just because of that. Um, or it's even impossible because there is simply no solution to make it completely band limited. Um, or you do something in between, you are creative, you're filtering and then anti-aliasing or do a half band limited approach and oversample that or something like that. The possibilities are quite endless. So oversampling. Oversampling is easy. We generate the stuff at a higher sampling rate, filter all the stuff, and then downsample. Um, yeah, which is quite easy because we have our naive sawtooth wave, sample it at about 4 or 8 or 16 or 32 or 256 um, times the rate. Then we apply a low pass filter, and then we downsample it. So we are like shifting the problem upwards. Um, you've seen the sawtooth wave has pretty, um, have pretty mu uh, much falls off uh, in its overtones. So um, if we do that fiercely enough, it w somehow works. Mm -hmm. Or if we're processing, we of course have um, input data, which is still perhaps still in the normal sampling rate. So we have to upsample that. So we have to convert it into a higher sampling rate. Um, and if we do that, we should uh, interpolate. So we should uh, not only double or triple or quadruple um, all values we get in, but, uh, but we should either interpolate between the values or use a low pass filter afterwards, because um, if you just double or triple or quadruple or t uh, take n times the same sample, uh, you got, of course, resampling artifacts and another kind of aliasing, which you then process, um, which perhaps leaves the aliasing in you get from upsampling. Uh, even if you've done that because you wanted to avoid aliasing, you introduce that. Um, so it's not a good idea not to interpolate. And the other thing is, if you downsample, you have to use the right filter kernel. You could take a box filter, which is a trivial approach. 
you, if you'd like, have four times oversampling, you simply take the four samples that are coming out, divide them by four, and you've got an average value, which is trivial, but kind of sucks, because um, it doesn't sound really good, because um, if we look at the frequency response of such a filter, um, it doesn't really cut off high frequencies, but it leaves holes in, this, uh, in the high frequencies, which is, uh, which uh, when high frequencies are let, let uh, sorry, <laughs> are being let through. So, if you downsample, use um, better filter kernel. For example, the sync function, which is, which is again completely unrelated. Sorry, um, the a perfect low pass filter, which you can approximate by an FIR finite impulse response filter, which is pretty much documented everywhere on the internet and in every DSP book, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you do that to real samples wide, not to oversampled samples, but to normal samples, you get pretty good results, actually. Okay, now to the beef. Band-limited synthesis is, of course, more or less the way to go. The problem is it's a big field in itself, lots of algorithms, like for every single thing you could do in audio, there's, there are like 10 band-limited approaches. There are um, impulse trains there are, uh, uh, and some heavy uh, stuff, but the simple stuff that I want to talk about now is, for example, additive synthesis. Additive synthesis is like the naive way of um, doing Fourier backwards. We know from Fourier that every signal is decomposed into single frequencies, which are signs. So we can simply take the, sign, the signs and build a whole signal which uh, with all overtones, with all, with all the sound that we want from signs. Um, this is of course CPU heavy because, for example, the anti-aliased um, sawtooth you've heard in my second example was built up of, of about 128 signs and it was still quite, quite, quite a mellow sound when it, was, uh, when it was down below. Like, it, it wasn't really sharp uh, in the bass area. Mm. So if you want to do that, it's quite CPU heavy because you have add to, uh, one hundreds of signs and uh, you really have to do some pretty heavy optimization there to make that feasible. But the good thing is it's highly flexible because you have control about over every single frequency. So you can do pretty wicked stuff. You can um, apply filters, for example, while you're synthesizing, not afterwards, because you have the uh, single frequencies laid out before you, before you even start to, ma to make the sound, and so you can apply the filter curve on those things. Um, you can also do some other stuff like letting uh, low frequency oscillators run through the spectrum, and it's really flexible because you can get a lot of strange waveforms out of it, out of it much more than normally uh, is, would be done with uh, virtual analog synthesis. The other thing is, if we're in the frequency domain. If we are dealing with um, frequencies, we can of course use the normal Fourier transform uh, or, the, or to say the fast inverse, inverse fast Fourier transform, IFFT, to generate the signal. It has one big advantage uh, over the naive additive uh, approach. It's fast. It's really, really, really much faster. It's, um, yeah, it's no, uh, it's <coughs> more or less no um, n-hard, but it's a log logarithm of n-hard problem, if we talk about that uh, in complexity terms. The problem is it's quite a pain in the to set up mm, because um, with additive synthesis, we have the big problem, with, uh, we, have the, we have the big advantage. If we add signs together, we can do this, uh, do this, do this, sorry, at every pitch. Mm, so we can simply modify the pitch, and uh, as soon as the pitch is, goes above the Nyquist frequency, we simply stop adding the signs, and so we have perfect anti-aliasing, while the IFFT beige approach is really, really hard to shift in pitch. So the IFFT based approach is more or less only good for sampling uh, or for generating uh, at exactly one pitch. So we can do samples with mid-maps. This time, uh, in contrast to the guy who spoke before me, Rook, we don't do this for cache efficiency, but we do this um, to prevent aliasing, like exactly the other way around. Um, the thing is, you could use the IFFT-based synthesis to generate small sample snippets, small looping samples of a sawtooth at 
for example, all octaves. And then you can simply use a looping sample playback to playback those samples, lay it over each other, and use this like trillion filtering on GPUs. So you play the sample which has the least aliasing and then the sample which is one octave higher um, at the same time and mix between it. The one thing is, um, if we do that, either we have the problem, we use the highest possible, freak, uh, highest possible sample and the one one octave below, which means um, that we lose uh, the area between sample rate uh, by, by four and sample rate by two because, um, of course, if we only sample down, uh, we lose treble. But the thing is, if we combine that with oversampling, we can use everything one octave higher. Then, of course, we get some aliasing in the area between half of the Nyquist and uh, half of the sample rate and the sample rate. But if we do two times oversampling, we can perfectly filter, uh, filter that away. So this is a um, fast, good approach to um, generate waveforms of every shape because you have the IFFT or the additive synthesis as, as base. But um, if you want to modulate them, it's really, really hard to do because, for example, as well, additive synthesis or IFFT-based synthesis aren't really good for pulse width modulation because there's some pretty wicked stuff going on if you modify the pulse width. Um, so it's more like what uh, a few synthesizers do, wavetable-based synthesis, that you have like 10, 16, 32 different waves with different spectrums and you can blend between the, uh, each other. So this is the thing you can do with uh, modulating the waveforms, but for real modulations like oscillator heart sinking, pulse width modulation and uh, frequency modulation, all that stuff, that sample midmap based approach is not really good. That's a big, big, big downside of that. So what approach might be good? Um, in the synthesizer I've coded, uh, the V2 synthesizer, which is, was used in all Fabrosh intros, I've found a quite nice hybrid approach. Um, I've used it for the triangle sawtooth and pulse waveforms. Triangle and sawtooth are basically the same uh, in my oscillator because it's like it goes up and it goes down and only the steepness be, uh, decides if it's a triangle or a sawtooth wave. So what if we took oversampling to infinity? Like we don't oversample two times, we don't oversample four times, we oversample infinite times because just like rules to imagine that. The thing is, we only have to integrate upon the oscillator function. Um, because we like want um, the filtered results, uh, filtered results of one part of the oscillator function. This is normally an integral. Um, if we want to filter it correctly, what I don't do, um, we have to multiply this oscillator function with a filtering function, which is normally a sync filter. But um, I've decided to go the easy way, easy way because like uh, an intro has to run while my synthesizer's running, all that stuff and all the other coders in Farbrausch always beat me up if I take too much CPU time. And so um, I resorted to box filtering. Box filtering, as I said, it's not really good, but, as, but I thought, okay, well, it's okay enough. <laughs> so the good thing is we only need to integrate upon the waveform function. And the waveform function with triangle and pulse is like totally easy. For pulse, it's the easiest ever. It's like zero from x zero to zero point whatever, and from zero point whatever to one. It's one, so it's two parts that are effectively constants. Mm. The thing is, if it's defined in intervals, of course, um, if we want to integrate upon a certain area of the function, we can, of course, cross an interval border. So we have to cope with that. So we have to split the function um, into part one and part two, or if we really are going fast over the waveform into part one, part two, and then part one again. Um, but the good thing about that is you can do that on paper. You don't, have to, you don't have to do that in code. You don't have to split it and then first calculate the one thing and then calculate the other thing. You can easily use pen and paper, paint the waveform, paint what you, uh, paint what you want to do, and then just write it down because um, in the end, we get a few special cases, uh, six cases to be precise, and those cases are effectively simple quadratic functions. So the good thing is, if we want to anti-alias with an infinite box filter, let's call that infinite box filter, um, 
we only have to calculate one quadratic function by sam uh, per sample. And this is not much more than the one linear function by uh, per sample we would have to calculate other words. Um, and if you do a bit of CPU optimization, for example, I've gone the, uh, I've gone the hard route and um, as many might probably know, the V2 synthesizer is coded in assembly language, 100%. And the good thing is, um, in assembly language, I did things like that the three bits which make up which case I'm dealing with per sample somehow magically make it into one register and I could use a jump table to jump into a set of small functions per, um, per case. If you try to code that in C or C++, it's a bit harder, but um, not too um, much slower. That's so okay. So my implementation in the end, when I tried it, was only 20% slower than the completely non-anti-laced variant of uh, the sawtooth of the triangle, which simply calculated one linear function per sample. So the only problem is box filtering does suck in the end. Um, of course, I was pretty happy with the thing. The only thing is, um, if you try to do serious music with that, you will find the limits pretty, pretty, pretty soon. And uh, you will try to play really, really high notes and you will hear some aliasing. Um, most of the time you can try to fake that away and let it drown in the rest of the arrangement, but it's definitely not perfect. But uh, don't worry, the next generation is underway. I'm already planning to um, formulate this um, with a whole sync filter kernel, but um, it's a bit hard on the math side and I uh, didn't have enough time for that, uh, so sorry. But if you want to do that, I can definitely recommend this method because it's fast and it's pretty anti-aliased, uh, at least in contrast to non-anti-aliased versions, or, and it's much, 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 much faster than every other band-limited approach. So, we're coming to processing steps. Aliasing can occur whenever an effect introduces new frequencies. That's a big problem. It's no problem with volume changes and filtering because volume changes simply change the volume of the signal and don't introduce anything um, normally. Okay, of course, if you get an LFO and you cut down the volume really fast, you can of course say, oh, there are a few frequencies introduced, but let's just safely ignore that because um, it doesn't really matter. So and if you change the volume, of course, you change the whole signal up and down and nothing really happens. Same thing with filtering. Filtering also only changes the volume of different frequencies. Um, so this is also really safe and there is no filter formula, no normal filter formula, which would be able to self-oscillate above the Nyquist frequency. So filters are completely safe. Um, what's really nasty is FM and uh, oscillator hard syncing. Um, I don't know if you know those terms or if you know how this sounds, but um, FM is when one oscillator modulates the frequency of another oscillator. If we do that, and we have to do that on a per sample basis, for example, my approach with the infinite oversampling doesn't work anymore because um, you're getting into fields of subsample precision and everything. And uh, so FM is um, pretty hard to anti aliase um, except if you do that uh, with um, the method that it be, has been uh, deployed uh, effectively by the Yamaha synthesizers since the good old DX7 in the 80s. Actually, this thing um, calculated the whole FM synthesis in the frequency domain and then let run, uh, let run b uh, one big IFFT um, above the whole thing and put it out and so completely avoided all aliasing. There's one, if you're interested, there's uh, at the Yamaha website, you get some 100 pages paper describing the math behind that. So it's not too easy, but it's possible. What's almost impossible is uh, oscillator syncing. Oscillator syncing is when uh, one oscillator uh, comes to the end of the wave it's playing and then forces another oscillator also to reset itself to the beginning of the waveform. This, redu uh, this, redu uh, this um, no, not reduces, this results, results was the word, sorry. This results in sounds um, which are full of high frequencies, which are really, really, really full of high frequencies and which will alias like hell if you try that. So without any kind of aliasing, you are completely screwed with OSC sync, uh, anti-aliasing, you are completely screwed with OSC syncing. 
And there are band-limited approaches, but the band-limited approaches are capable of doing a handful of oscillators at the moment. Um, the only real choice you have is um, to hard sync or to um, try to get uh, access to the company called Access and ask how they've done it in their virus because that's the only synthesizer I know that um, does perfect aliasing free oscillator syncing, but they won't tell anyone. Mm. And there's definitely no good paper out there. I tried to search in the internet. So the last big great aliasing generator is distortion. Distortion lives from introducing new frequencies in the sample. Normal distortion is harmonic distortion, which takes the existing frequencies and multiples of these existing frequencies and um, exaggerates them. And if you do distortion, depending on the formula, you get again waves and frequencies which go up to infinity and beyond. Because, uh, for example, if you do a simple distortion formula which um, substitutes one for every positive and substitutes minus one for every negative value, and you put a sine wave in it, then the resulting wave will be a rectangle wave because it's like always minus one or it's always one. And so it's a rectangle wave with all the infinite overtones that a rectangle wave has. And of course, this introduces a good lot of aliasing. So the problem with distortion is there is no really recipe which does work always. So the safe thing is oversampling it a bit, which is quite hard to do CPU-wise because distortion formulas are often CPU intensive pretty much in itself, so be a bit careful. Or another thing is you can pre-filter the signal and try to get the high frequencies out of the signal before you distort, um, because then you, of course, pretty much reduce um, the frequencies which are occurring after the distortion. But, well, perhaps you actually like dirt. So if you want it dirty, if you want it sounds like some 80s modulo, if you are into industrial, just don't oversample. Just live with all the aliasing, because for some musical styles it really sounds great. <laughs> so, of course, we come to the conclusion, like 10 minutes too early, but this is better than vice versa. Um, use at least 24 bits for your signal if you represent it, because if you use too few bits, as soon as, as you apply a few effects on your signal, it will start to get noisier and noisier and noisier, and this is shit. This, sounds, this doesn't even sound good. This sounds unprofessional. So using 24 bits for the signal or 32-bit floats is no problem because modern CPUs are working with 32 bits anyway, so why waste that? Then the sampling aliasing can occur almost everywhere, and every time the solution is different. Like if you went here to get this solution to get rid of all your aliasing problems, forget that. For every part in your code, you have to find another solution or even test about 10 or 20 solutions until you find that one that is best in terms of CPU time or code time or mathematical heaviness or even sound quality which does mean that uh, you guys doing 4K intros are pretty screwed because um, if every algorithm has to be um, anti-aliased uh, on another way, of course, this introduces a lot of code in your synthesizer. So if you're doing 4K synthesizers, it's better to oversample the complete synthesizer and uh, then filter down and then just live that it takes a lot, a lot of CPU because uh, anyway, 4K intros have been pretty slow for the last few years, so the, the, if it's now 9 or 7 FPS, it's pretty okay, I think. Uh, um, it doesn't matter at all. You, you, you can always say buy a faster computer or something like that. <laughs> or it's only 4K, that's a good excuse. Um, and in the end, don't look at the maths. Don't fall victim to papers which promise, oh, I have in, uh, we have the ultimate solution, ultimate band-limited solution to this and that problem, and perhaps it is the ultimate solution per, for this and that problem, but what if it takes four times as much CPU as a, a few times oversampling would take and it doesn't really sound better in your application? So in the end, try out and listen to, to the stuff. Try out and listen to aliasing itself. For example, my examples uh, used only 16 kilohertz of sampling rate to exaggerate the aliasing that you could hear. So you, you should do that with your code. You should try to let your synthesizer render at 11 kilohertz because this will show how good the anti-aliasing 
really is and how aliasing sounds. So listen to a synthesizer and if it's dirty, then it is, that, is, that is most probably aliasing. So, and you can do something about that if you want. Okay, yeah, this kind of was it. Um, any questions? No. Okay, this is sad, but okay. <laughs> Thank you.